2019. What a year for football. So much happened. From Barcelona's collapse at Anfield, the John Stones clearance to win the league, Ajax's unbelievable run in the Champions League, and most importantly of course, Leighton Orient's first league title in 40 years. But I don't want to focus on any of that, as at the beginning of the year, Brighton had seen their greatest ever start to a Premier League season, with the club up in 11th. With Chris Hewton at the helm, it wouldn't take long before things started to go badly, as they went the next two months without a win, losing 11 of the final 18 games and staying up by just two points. The Brighton board knew change was necessary, and so on the 13th of May 2019, Chris Hewton was sacked. Little did anyone know at the time, but this decision would go on to be monumental in the future of Brighton and Hove Albion Football Club. Fast forward four years, two managers and a ridiculous amount of talent, and the Seagulls have never been in a better position than they are right now. This is the story of Brighton's rise from irrelevancy to being the most exciting team in England. You may think I'm about to start off this video by talking about Graham Potter and his remarkable impact at the Seagulls, but if we're being truthful, he played a minor role in the rise of the club. Around the turn of the millennium, a childhood Brighton fan bought his first stakes in the club, and by 2009, he'd gained pretty much complete control of the side, which is where our story really begins. Skip to the end of 2011, and he'd moved them out of the Withdean Stadium and into the Amex, a Premier League ready ground, with a capacity nearly three times larger than their former home. Not only this, but his investment carried the club from the third division to the brink of the Premier League, where for years Brighton became a bit of a nearly team, finishing in the playoffs three years in the previous four campaigns before finally reaching the promised land in 2017. Having made his money in sports gambling, Tony Bloom is far from being scared of a risk, and so wasn't afraid to dismiss the pragmatic Chris Hewton in favour of a more attacking style. And this, of course, is where Graham Potter comes into things. <laughs> Just joking, thought I'd tease you all again. Bloom's biggest success story arguably came in 2014, but after losing to Derby County in the playoffs, he decided to steal the head of recruitment, Paul Winstonley. And over the next eight years, Brighton saw a remarkable amount of talent join the club, as their squad value increased by over 1,000%. Not only this, but Brighton's academy has been incredible in recent years, where John Morling did a great job at bringing through talent for a decade at the Amex Stadium. And so when Graham Potter arrived in the South Coast in the summer of 2019, he had a squad jam-packed full of quote-unquote hidden talents. That being said though, there would be a lot of transfer business done once he realised who simply would not work in his system. Nine players would be kicked out and replaced by ten new faces ready for the new campaign. Potter quickly implemented his now iconic system flexibility, using a variety of formations over the course of the campaign, which helped to make them more unpredictable. As well as this, he also oversaw a huge increase in terms of playing out from the back, with the signing of Adam Webster slotting in perfectly next to Dan Byrne, whether that was in a three or four in defence. And these changes made a huge impact, as Brighton started the season well, even finding themselves in the top four at one stage, before settling down in eighth by the start of November. Most notably of all though, Brighton were causing the big team's issues, whereby the 1st of January, the Seagulls had beaten both Spurs and Arsenal, as well as taking points off of Chelsea, and only lost out to eventual champions Liverpool by one goal. Talking in Liverpool, if you're new here make sure you subscribe to stay up to date with all of our videos. Now back onto Brighton. Despite their great start, as we clocked over into 2020, it would be like deja vu for the Brighton fans. Nine straight games without a win going into the pandemic gave the supporters something extra to worry about. But after effectively having an extra pre-season to work with his players, Potter's Brighton came back strongly, winning three of their final nine games, including the infamous Morpay incident, not losing a single game to a team outside the top three. The season would see them rise two places up to 15th, the first example of progress under the new coach. Not only this, but youth would also be given the chance to shine, with Connolly, Basuma, Alzat and Lamptey all starring in Potter's system, ready for the new season. In the summer, Lallana and Welbeck would join the young side, which despite having seemingly made significant progress in terms of performances, would struggle for results. By the new year, Brighton was 17th in the league, just one place above the drop, having seemingly become everyone's second favourite side due to their rotten luck. At times, it seemed like they couldn't buy a goal, and even in games where they managed to score, the opposition would somehow bag a winner after the final whistle. And on top of this, throughout the whole of 2020, they won just a single home game, setting a new record for the club before hosting Tottenham on the 31st of January. In a scrappy affair, Brighton were finally able to get that win before going on to finish an entire 13 points clear of relegation. Despite the fact that if you were to only look at the table, it looked like no progress had been made at the Amex, many were excited for what the Seagulls could do going into the 21-22 season, and they didn't disappoint, even finding themselves fourth after eight games. Brighton would end up in ninth come the end of the season, however showed a continued weakness in their consistency. A spell of 11 games without a win between September and December, as well as six straight losses in February and March derailed any European hopes. However, performances like their 4-0 battering of Man United showed they certainly weren't a team to be messed with. McAllister, Trossard and Gross were amongst those that exceeded expectations, as well as Basuma and Kukureo who would move on for a combined £80 million, showing that the squad had real quality, a true testament to just how good their recruitment was. 
But this is where we see another twist in the story. In February, Newcastle poached Brighton's technical director Dan Ashworth, leaving many fans of the club worried as to who would take over. Luckily though, Tony Bloom is no fool. Knowing that Brighton would likely see their talent on and off the pitch being poached, his and the board's strategy is remarkable, with the club always a step ahead of everyone else. Just a few months later in May, David Weir would be promoted to technical director, having already overseen the growth of Moises Caicedo and Alexis McAllister whilst they were out on loan abroad, with the side's global infrastructure being remarkable. Seven of Brighton's 25-man squad are South American, even boasting a World Cup winner in McAllister, something you'd be shocked to hear about just a decade ago. And not only this, but the Seagulls have a very unique tool in Belgian side Union saint gilois another team Bloom owns, who've almost acted as a feeder club for them. The likes of Matoma and Dennis Undav both featured for the Belgian team last year, with the former starring in the Premier League right now, having been eased into European football. Oh yeah, and what happens when Matoma is undoubtedly poached by a bigger side? then they could just replace him with another one of the players at Union right now, with 21-year-old Simon Adingra being a perfect example. Furthermore, Bloom's ownership of the Belgian team has proven his analytical-based system isn't just a fluke, having also seen them rise from the second tier up to the top of the league for most of last campaign. With Potter having left the club in September, it would take Brighton just 10 days to replace him, bringing in De Zerbi, a manager who's arguably even better, as the Seagulls have seemingly found a more sustainable system. And Brighton didn't just find these managers, players, directors and so on by fluke. Everything about the club is planned out meticulously by those at the top, meaning that whatever challenge you throw at them, they bounce back stronger through an elite recruitment and scouting strategy which not only covers players or coaches, but even the people who are running the strategy right now. Which means that no matter what, they're going to keep getting better. Don't believe me? Well, when Potter left the club in fourth place in September, they'd perfectly matched their performance from the season previously. However, if you look at them now, despite being down in seventh, they've actually won four more points under the Zerbi than they had with Potter last season. Not enough for you? Well, after losing Trossard, many were worried about how they'd replace him. Step forwards like a Ferguson and Matoma, who've been absolutely electric, and were each signed all the way back in 2021. And when De Zerbi eventually leaves the club, he'll be replaced by someone they're already monitoring right now, like Iriola of Rayo Vallecano, for example. But let's pause that now and focus back on their on-pitch performances, as this year we've seen players like Caicedo, McAllister, Estupinian, Sanchez, Matoma and so on be absolutely incredible. Yet before they joined the Seagulls, very few people knew of them. And the Zerbi's tactical know-how has opened up even more avenues for Brighton to attack teams. Potter may have been the man to lay down foundations for this Brighton side, but the Zerbi have made them even better. Out of possession and they press extremely well, and having been used to playing out from the back for a number of seasons, the Zerbi's brought in his iconic pressing traps allowing them to break down teams playing in a lower block, which can only help them in being a more consistent team throughout an entire season, finding a middle ground between transitional and possession based styles of play. And all you need to do is look at the last few games they've played to see that it's working. A three goal win against Everton and then Liverpool, two teams that are near polar opposites, has shown this diversity in Brighton's performances, which can only make them harder to play. Most importantly though, with Liverpool, Chelsea and Spurs all struggling this season, Brighton's strong start means it's highly plausible they can make Europe, which will only increase their spending power and pull for players, in turn making them even stronger for the next campaign. And so to put it simply, the Seagulls might start to be a real problem for the bigger teams in the division. I've seen a lot of people compare Brighton's rise to that of Southampton's, and sure, if you look at it from afar, they do look similar. Both teams rose up from League One to the Premier League, bought smartly and had a few good youth academy prospects come through as they then started to challenge for Europe. However, if you ask me, comparing Brighton to Southampton is just disrespectful to the Seagulls. Southampton did so well through getting quality in the higher ups, who in turn were then able to find quality players, managers and so forth. But the problem with Southampton was that they heavily relied on a few people behind the scenes like Paul Mitchell for example, who after leaving left the Saints without a solution. And when you compare that to Bloom and his meticulous system, you can see that it's night and day. In fact, I'm so confident in the future of Brighton that I'm about to make a very bold call. I think that in 10 years time, we will look at the Seagulls as being closer in success to Spurs than Southampton. Look at who Brighton have lost in the last year and then have gone on to improve. Dan Byrne and Ashworth both left for Newcastle. They still improved. Potter took four coaches and Paul Winston to Chelsea. They still improved. With an owner who's both dedicated to the club and also massively smart, the Seagulls will only continue to improve. And so like it or not, I think Brighton may just be here to stay. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed. Sorry if I didn't cover as much of the on-pitch side of things as you might have liked, but to be honest I did that so I can cover the subject again down the line, focusing on footballing performances rather than the big picture. Also, please like and subscribe if you're new, and most importantly, enjoy your day.